Fence and the Grenadines. St. Vincent and the Grenadines. What about Cameroon? Cameroon. <laughs> what about Vatican City? The Vatican City. Yeah. What about Thailand? And Thailand. Well, what about the World Cup? Well, so, um, do you know you're super smart? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can't all be quite as genius as that two-year-old, but the reality is we all need to use our brains every day to make sense of the world, make decisions, and process information. Today, we're gonna to be talking about cognition. So go ahead and grab your concept study guide, your notes, and your books, and study along with me. Today, we're going to be in Giddens chapter 33. You'll be using concept study guide version B for this topic today, and we will be accomplishing these objectives. So let's talk first about defining and describing the concept of cognition. So cognition is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. In other words, it's the way our brain functions and processes and understands all of the information in our world. Now the scope of this contact really concept really ranges from intact to impaired, meaning yes, you've got good cognition, to you have impaired cognition, impaired understanding and knowledge. Um, and that continuum can change over time. It can change acutely, meaning suddenly, or it can change slowly and be chronic change. And that impairment itself can have a scope from mild to severe cognitive impairment. And then you've got those kids on the other end in the spectrum, like we saw at the beginning clip, where there's that higher order cognitive function. So let's talk about the normal physiologic process of the brain. Now the brain has four major units, the cerebrum where most thinking occurs and processing of information, the diencephalon which is located deep in the brain and it's really the go between between the endocrine system and the brain, the brain stem which controls those um, involuntary basic human functions like our breathing and our heart rate, and then the cerebellum is where motor function, the ability to move intentionally and voluntarily um, is located. And really our brains demand, demand high levels of oxygen and depend on continuous perfusion, continuous oxygenated blood flow in order to uh, stay healthy and function. Now, your book in Giddens has some more information about this, and I'd like you to pause here and also, and read that part on Giddens 321, but also take a look at the two links below. It's like four minutes total, uh, talking a little bit more about the anatomy uh, and the different lobes of the cerebrum, as well as just how our brain processes information. So take a look at your text, look at those two video links linked in the description box below, and I'll see you back here in a minute. Now there are certainly variations in context to the idea of cognitive impairment. So things where cognition is not the way it should be functioning normally. And there's a variety of these that you're seeing on the slide, delirium, dementia, focal cognitive disorders, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities. And we're gonna break down and talk about these each individually. So turn with me if you would to page 322 as we talk about this. So let's first talk about delirium. Now delirium is disturbed consciousness and altered cognition that happens rapidly and acute. This isn't something that happens slowly over time. This is happening within a few minutes to hours or maybe a few days. And it revolves, involves adult awareness of the environment, reduced ability to focus, restlessness, and oftentimes memory and judgment can be impaired. And you may, may even notice that the patient's speech is incoherent, unable to be understood, rambling or rapid. There can be sudden and very intense uh, changes in mood and emotional swings, hallucinations and delusions can also occur. Now delirium is often the, something that we'll see uh, as, a comp as a hospitalization complication in the elderly population specifically. And there are a number of physiologic um, imbalances that can cause delirium in patients. 
things like illicit drug use. So people who are high on PCP are going to be, you know, very hallucinating and very having very strong emotions, emotionally unstable, um, unable to really make a sense of reality. Um, but it can also be things like dehydration, shifts in fluid and electrolytes, which we're going to get into in a few weeks, fever or hypoxia, meaning low oxygen levels. All of those things can cause delirium, an acute change in cognitive function. And remember, our brains are hungry for oxygen and delirium can be happening when something goes out of whack um, and is imbalanced, causing acute delirium. The second one on your sheet there on your figure 33.3 on page 3 through 22 is neurocognitive disorders. Now this follows under the umbrella of things like dementia and Alzheimer's. They are um, disorders uh, that are acquired and are show a progressive deterioration over months to years of all cognitive functioning. Now primary dementia means it's the only you know, cause of the cognitive impairment. And secondary dementia means it's happening as a result of another type of illness. Now the third category on your sheet is something called cognitive impairment non-dementia or mild cognitive impairment. And this is somewhere between you know, the scope of dementia and normal cognitive functioning. It's somewhere right in between there where an individual has some cognitive impairment but not cognitive impairment in all areas. Um, and this happens over time. Now certainly individuals who have mild cognitive impairment are at higher risk for leading into dementia. And it's something that you know, the neurology team would wanna take a close look at and monitor for any signs of progression of the cognitive impairment. The next part on your um, cognitive impairment list is focal cognitive disorders. And so this one, focal means only one part. And so it affects a single area of cognitive functioning. So it could be that the patient is affected in their language or affected in their ability to memorize or their effective visuospatial, you know, understanding, you know, space around them. And um, so these are all, they're all impaired in one specific area. The next section is an intellectual disability. And this is for an individual who scores less than a 70 on their IQ test and shows just general um, intellectual um, disability. And it can be things like uh, patients who have Down syndrome or fetal alcohol syndrome or cerebral anoxia where their brain uh, lost oxygen during the birthing process. All of these things can cause damage to the brain, which then has intellectual cognitive um, impairment throughout their lifetime. And finally is learning disabilities. Uh, patients who have a difficulty learning or processing or receiving information, it can be things like dyslexia, um, problems with writing, problems with mathematics, calculating and reasoning, um, learning and, and reading skills and reading comprehension. And that's why many schools have reading specialists and um, special education departments to make sure that learners are supported through their learning disability. And in terms of learning disability, if we're thinking about patient education, we really need to decide, you know, what, what is our patient's ability to learn and how do we provide information in a way that they're able to understand and receive it appropriately. And so those are all the variations in context, the specific types of cognitive impairment that we're talking about. And obviously for this week, we're really focusing on the dementia, the Alzheimer's type of cognitive impairment. There can be consequences, certainly, to cognitive impairment for whatever the reason of it. And it puts patients at increased uh, risk for safety issues, risks for injuries. It complicates disease matters uh, management because patients aren't able to participate as well in their care. And um, it can really cause decreased functional ability, including the patient's ability to maintain activities of daily living, um, be independent, and maintain normal social interactions. You may see patients with cognitive impairment have an increased need for assistive services. They also may uh, experience more hardship financially because they're unable to you know, obtain higher paying uh, jobs. And there can be caregiver burden. So when you're thinking about the patient, you also wanna think about the family unit and um, what this really means for the family and for the caregivers and assessing how they're doing um, because burnout can be real with caregivers. And we wanna make sure that we offer support and um, resources for them as well.